Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be waiting a couple of minutes before we start the webinar. In the meantime, I'll start promoting everybody from attendee to panelists. So if you do get a request from me, please accept it so that you can turn on your cameras and microphones during the Q&A portion and throughout the lecture. Um, if by some reason you do not get a request from me, just raise your virtual hand and I'll go back and promote you. Thank you. Daphne, how would you like us to do questions after the sessions? Would you like people to yeah. raise their hands? You don't want anyone to use the chat function at all. So for the, yeah. we hold a Q&A session at the end after yeah. everybody has spoken. People are welcome to put their questions in the chat, but they can also raise their hands and then Charles or I will um, pick on them for them to speak or you, Julian, as well. Okay, and I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat questions as well and maybe pick a few out um as and when is necessary i think julian should sort of you should choose who to yeah that I, works I great okay gosh such such responsibility charles <laughs> i can text you if i if i don't know if i see something i'll text you or something yeah i'll just send me a message direct message on the on the zoom That's okay easy. yeah Perfect. How come nobody, we don't see anybody? I'm promoting folks. Um, it is up to them whether they want their cameras on or not. I welcome everybody to turn on their cameras throughout the session. Once again, I'm going around and promoting everybody from attendee to panelist. Um, would love if you would accept my request and join us in this lecture. Thank you. Hello, Chris. Hey, Gary. Hi. <laughs> no. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. So everybody, please turn on your camera so we can sort of create a bit of a virtual community. I hope nobody objects to having breakfast during the session. We preempted the fact that some people would be eating breakfast. We have no objections. You have to be careful what we wish for. <laughs> yeah. Some of us are in Europe and it's uh, tea time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Nine o'clock in the morning here, it's enough to uh, drive one to drink. <laughs> Hi, Sydney. Sydney Perry. How are you? I'm it's well. A long time, sir. Great to see you. How are you? I'm happy to see you too. Nice to see you. I, I follow you. I follow you. <laughs> I hope all's well with you and your family. Wonderful. Good, good. 21 children, grandchildren. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> That's the answer to this day. Yeah. I'm glad you made the grandchildren versus children correction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but it was six kids. So, you know, you have to have a certain amount to get that to that. Part. Bokertov, Nadia. yeah. It's already 5 p.m. in Israel, but still Bokertov, yes. Somewhere this morning. I guess we will start. What do you think, Daphne? I think we could get started. We're still we're recording it, so if people miss the beginning, they can catch up on our YouTube page. Okay. All right. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody on this auspicious day. Uh, I'm Charles Small. I'm the director of ISGAP, as many I know many of you on, online. 
And today we have a special group of uh, colleagues and scholars who will be running today's event. We have Lev Topper, who's a ISGAP fellow at the Wolf Institute in Cambridge, and Stephanie uh, Shear, who's a scholar on issues of Holocaust, she'll be joining us, and Julian Hargraves, who's the head of research at the Wolf Institute, where ISGAP has a small postdoctoral research training program on anti-Semitism. He'll be uh, running the, the event today. So I'll turn it over to our colleague, Julian. Thank you, Charles. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's um, it's great to be with you uh, today. Um, it's a great privilege to be chairing this event. And uh, I realize that I will be unfamiliar to some or indeed most of you um, on this uh, meeting, on this call today. So my name is Dr. Julian Hargreaves. I'm the Director of Research at the Wolf Institute in Cambridge. And it's, it's our great privilege to host ISCAP, as, um, as Charles mentioned. Uh, we uh, together have a centre looking at uh, critical contemporary anti-Semitism studies and are joined by one of the ISCAP fellows on the programme, uh, Dr. Lev Torpa today. Um, the Wolf Institute, for those who don't know, is an interfaith charity based in Cambridge. And whilst we're an independent organisation, we have very strong ties to the University of Cambridge and offer teaching on uh, Muslim Jewish relations and also fund PhD scholars at the, at the university. Um, our research work takes in interfaith issues from the three Abrahamic faiths. We research uh, Christian, Jewish and Muslim communities in the UK, in Europe and indeed around the world. And my own work has touched on um, some uh, considerations of anti-Semitism. So I've, I've looked at statistical comparisons of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and more recently I've looked at anti-Semitism across a number of social media platforms, including uh, Twitter and, and Google. But um, today we're going to be um, focused uh, very much on uh, Holocaust remembrance. And I suppose there's an overarching question to today's event. And that question is, how will the Shoah be remembered in 2045? And how will the events of the Holocaust be remembered in the 22nd century? And uh, this question, I think, invites reflection on, on the legacy of the historical events in, in years to come. And when we no longer have the voices of the survivors of the Holocaust, how will these issues be remembered and framed and analysed? How will they generate discourse? What will the challenges be to that? We know that as of 2023, education on the Holocaust is often inadequate. And we know that with the passage of time, uh, a certain type of knowledge of the events is, is, is diminishing. So with that in mind, we have um, three speakers today who will each pick up slightly different aspects of um, Holocaust remembrance. And um, first we'll be, um, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Stephanie Corbel shah I hope I've pronounced that correctly. I didn't ask you before the event how to do it. That's, that's our, I mean, no offense if I've mispronounced it. But uh, Dr. Stephanie is a historian uh, and a specialist in Holocaust denial and lectures on, on that topic um, and also consults for a range of international um, organisations. Um, in the time that we'll hear from Stephanie, um, she'll speak about Holocaust denial and some of the nuances between memory and history and some of the different types of Holocaust denial arguments that we might uh, come across. Then I'll be um, handing the floor uh, back to Charles and uh, we'll be hearing from Charles on some of the contemporary issues around anti-Semitism, particularly within the context of rising contemporary anti-Semitism. We'll hear about some of the contemporary political and um, intellectual discourse uh, and the defining of, um, of Jewish people, uh, Zionism and, and the State of Israel. And then following that, we'll uh, be hearing from Dr. Lev Torpo, 
and um, Lev's expertise is very much on the um, intersection of politics and technology. And we'll be hearing from, from Lev. Uh, I don't have exact details, but knowing Lev's work as I do, I'm sure we're going to hear something about the internet and something about uh, cyber threat and something about the presence of anti-Semitism online. So without further ado, uh, I'd like now to hand the floor over for the next 10 minutes to Dr. Stephanie. Over to you. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you very much Al, for the invitation and Lev also who proposed this uh, seminar. And uh, as you said, I don't need to present myself because you did it already and I have 10 minutes to present the subject. So it's not a lot and the subject is so large that I could spend hours talking about Holocaust denial, but I'm going to be short and just for me, the main issue for now, I think, and then after we will talk about the memory and how to um, talk about Holocaust denial We have the memory and the last of the survivor, but I think for now, I would like to introduce the subject with the term Holocaust denial, because for and for more and more, we're talking about Holocaust denial and distortion. We're talking about uh, revisionist. And so what is the difference between Holocaust denial and distortionist and revisionist? And I think it's very important. And when I will describe Holocaust denial, I will, uh, Holocaust deniers, I will describe also the different typology or arguments of Holocaust deniers. So uh, for uh, one aspect for now, it's Holocaust denial. And I think it's, I, I try to explain uh, the um, Holocaust denial with different typology and first one is the denial of the Jewish people as a victim. And it's the first one that it's important to understand because it's related to the Nazi propaganda. And also it was a claim of the Nazi propaganda the fact that Holocaust den uh, the Jewish people as not the victim, but has more related to the fact that the Jewish people represent as responsible of the war as, as the bureau as a com with, related with the communists. And so this idea or the fact that the Holocaust denier deny the Jewish people as a victim is very important and it's the main issue. Second issue that Holocaust deniers are using is the denial of the ampleur. The ex they, they think, they, they say that the Holocaust denial, the, they say that the, the number of the victim is less than what we think. And it's, it's like they use this argument as um, all the time. And also there is the denial of the intention of the Nazism. It's, uh, they, they, they think that Hitler didn't want the extermination, Hitler didn't want the war. And so it's another kind of typology that we can see on denial. The last, the last I, I did four typology, and I think it's important to see the last one because it's the most used now is the denial, the modality of the mass crime. It's mean that they deny the gas chamber, they deny the, the crematorium and the vans of the gas, the gas van, etc. So we have this typology with four um, denial, but as we have to understand, and it's now more important to understand the fact that we don't use only Holocaust denial, but the word distortion. Holocaust denial are not only Holocaust deniers. And it's the problem that we always confuse, it's, it's always a little bit confusing, it's Holocaust denial are also distortionist. It means that they not only deny the Holocaust, but they uh, manipulate the history, they distort the history, they create another uh, fake history. For example, I can tell you just some, some one or two examples to explain what I'm saying about distortionists. They will say that uh, the ghetto was being used not for keeping all the, Jew the Jewish people before the extermination, but it was keeping for uh, the security of the Jewish people. On another example that I can explain is like, for example, they will uh, they will explain uh, why um, uh, Jewish people don't, didn't find each other after the war. Because for them, the Jewish people didn't die and they were hiding themselves with fake name. And they explained that if the Jewish people didn't find themselves um, after the war, it's because, be because before the war, they were forced in marriage. 
they were forced to uh, to be together and so after the war they didn't want to be again together so they um, they um, they, so they hide themselves with fake neck, et cetera. So we, we find that with all this issue, with all this distortion, we can find all the, 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 the idea of conspiracy that is behind, of course, the fact that the Jewish people are behind fake name means that they are more number that we think. So this is, um, uh, the distortion is, and is very important and more and more we are using this, this, this term of distortion to explain not only people who just deny the Holocaust, but people who, who are not uh, going to deny the Holocaust, but just distort the Holocaust. It means that people don't uh, go behind or go, don't go further. And so they don't uh, decide to just keep the distortion and not the denial of Holocaust. And we can see it more and more in uh, these countries uh, with nationalist ideas. And so the, 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 we can explain that the collaborator are less, uh, are not the collaborator. And so it's all the idea of distortion and can be summarized with so many um, definition because distortion is not only um, manipulation, but it's tribalization, it's vandalization. So anyway, I'm not going to go on it because it, it could take longer to explain it, but it's important to see the difference between Holocaust denial and distortion and to think that Holocaust denial are also distortionists. Now, there is a third term that it's important to explain is revisionist because it's always used and it has been used a lot. Even uh, all the time we can see historical revisionists to call Holocaust deniers. And it's very important to not use this word to, to, to uh, name them. Why? So um, first, because Holocaust deniers are using this word for calling themselves. They call themselves revisionists. And they call the people who believe in the Holocaust, they call them exterminationists. So this is the word that they're using to call Holocaust deniers. And then the other, the, they call historian rev exterminationists and they call themselves revisionists. So the term revisionist is give them a legitimacy that we shouldn't give them because it's a term that historians are using for themselves because all the time the historians are reviewing all the time history because new archive are coming because uh, we are, uh, re-examinate the history. And so the word revisionist is used by, your, is by the Holocaust deniers because it's a term that uh, gives them legitimacy. So it's very important to not give them this term. So um, I don't know if I'm enough uh, and the time or if you, if you want that I continue a little bit. Please do continue. Okay, so now I can continue a little bit on explaining um, Holocaust deniers as an historical um, um, movement because it's uh, it's important to see that Holocaust deniers and uh, has been um, in in has been created has been uh, uh, created as a movement since the end of the war and so we have. Um, at the beginning, it was just some kind of sentence, some kind of some, um, um, review that was being created uh, for, uh, by neo-Nazi, far right, and they wanted to whitewash Holocaust, they wanted to whitewash the Holocaust, they wanted to decuspabilize themselves. Uh, of the mass crime, and they wanted to glorify as well the Holocaust. So for them, it was very important to do all of it. And the Holocaust denial was um, a, a good um, argument, a good rhetoric to glorify the Nazism or to renew the Nazism. So we came with a movement who just has been created at the hand of the war. And uh, more and more, uh, they, they, they create uh, the rhetoric the, uh, the pseudo-scientific report. They create the movement. We can see that we have um, Holocaust denial uh, uh, books that start in the 60, in the 70, and then we start with the big scandal in the 80 because they start the strategy communication to more send mailing lists to everybody about uh, what they think. We have different association. They start uh, writing book, publishing house, and a Haiti and a 90. 
And then after in a twenty in a in a, in a thousand in a twenty thousand, we have the beginning of uh, uh, with internet. We have uh, a, a, th a strong uh, uh, Holocaust denial movement with internet, and maybe Lev will talk more about the fact that. Um, Holocaust deniers are more in, intensive with uh, with internet, so I will let him talk about that. And then uh, I think we can say that Iran and also all the um, movement came with uh, help and support of, of the state of Iran, who give them a, a, a more um, a more strength uh, on the on the movement. So if uh, it's enough. I'm. Um, I give you the main issue, the main, the main introduction of Holocaust denial. Thank you, Stephanie. I um, I feel terrible really talking after you after so few minutes. I know uh, yeah. your wealth of expertise could have uh, you know could have offered us uh, an hour or more. Uh, but um, what I'm hoping is that your short summary will uh, inspire some questions and comments, and perhaps as an opportunity. Uh, in a few moments for you to, to share more of your expertise um, with us. Um, but for the time being, I'd like to um, hand the floor um, back to Charles. Um, Charles is, of course, the founding director and the president of the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And um, it's, it's been a great pleasure to, to work alongside him um, as part of the ISCAP Wolf Institute initi initiative, the um, Fellowship training program. So, Charles, may I invite you for ten minutes or so to place some of um, Stephanie's work in 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 context and maybe um, frame for us these these issues. Thank you, Julian, and um, and it's uh, it's nice that you're here with us on this uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. And uh, you know the the team at ISGAP is very grateful to you and the team at the Wolf Institute that we're able to work together on very uh, important and timely issues. So we're grateful for that. So thank you, Julian. Thank I'll you, Charles. Start, you. I'll, start, I'll start with a, a quote uh, from Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was the founding president uh, of ISGAP and we helped to establish it after a 2003 um, conference at the United Nations that Elie Wiesel and Kofi Annan uh, hosted. It was the first um, program on anti-Semitism at the UN. It took until 2003 for the United Nations, which was born of the, uh, out of the ashes of the Holocaust uh, to deal with issues of anti-Semitism. Elie Wiesel, one, one quote uh, that I found, and of course he was um, an incredible teacher and uh, witness to evil. Elie Wiesel, and I quote, sometimes I'm asked if I know the response to Auschwitz. I answer that not only do I not do I not know it, but that I do not even know if a tragedy of this magnitude has a response. So this is what we're dealing with. Primo Levi, and I quote, Auschwitz is outside of us, but it is all around us in the air. The plague has died away, but the infection still lingers, and it would be foolish to deny it. Rejection of human solidarity, obtuse and cynical indifference to the suffering of others, abdication of the intellect and of moral sense to the principle of authority and above all, to, at the root of everything, a sweeping tide of cowardice, a colossal cowardice which masks itself as, which masks itself as warring virtue, love of country and a faith in an idea. That's from Primo Levi. And I'd also like to read a quote from David Graber. And this is what David Graber wrote in Warsaw, during the Warsaw uprising. uprising. What we were unable to cry and shriek out to the world, we buried in the ground. I would love to see the moment in which the great treasure will be dug up and scream the truth to the world, so the world may know all, may know that that may know the treasure falls into good hands, may it last into better times, may it alarm and alert the world to what happened in the 20th century. We may now die in peace. We fulfilled our mission. May history attest for all of us. And this was 
people bearing their their last will and testament and recording of what they experienced uh, during during the Holocaust. So what 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 words uh, do we say today? You know, what words uh, are we capable of saying and understanding? Primo Levi also said that the people who survived the Holocaust were actually not witness to the Holocaust, that the people who who perished in the Holocaust were the ultimate witnesses, and those who survived were an anomaly to, to what happened. It was a sort of a mistake of history that they survived. So we have to really commemorate how Auschwitz was created. How is it possible in this day? And how is it possible in 2023 when I hear my colleagues Stephanie and Lev who are now, we're not even focusing our, on the memory of the survivors. In less than two generations, we are now the intellects, Stephanie and Lev, are putting their effort and their hours and their career into defending the memory, defending our memory against the anti-Semites. Imagine. Imagine that this is what we have to put our energy in to protect the memory. And as Elie Wiesel said, when people try to, to revise the history, attack the memory, it's, a, it's in a sense, it's a, it's a second attempt at murder, murdering our memory. And this is what's at stake. The anti-Semites, the radical Islamists, the radical left, many of them on the left, intellectuals at our finest universities, the radical right and white supremacists are attempting to murder the memory of the Jewish people. It's an, a, sec, a second attempt at murder. So what is there to say? So I don't, I don't, I, you know, with, with no false humility, I don't really have the words or the capacity, but I'll try to, to say some, some, some thoughts. Today, on Yom HaShoah, the president of Iran has threatened to annihilate the Jewish people. This is old news. And what is so tragic to me is not the fact that the Iranian revolutionary regime, which is run by a group of people that demonize all sorts of groups of people, gay people, women who are risking their lives to stand up for freedom, um, moderate Muslims, but this ideological necessity to destroy the state of Israel and to use the protocols of the elders of Zion to demonize Jewish people throughout the world, that's bad enough. But what is staggering to me is where are the intellectuals? Where are the intellectuals at Oxbridge, at the Ivy Leagues, at the Sorbonne? Where are they? Why is there silence? Why is the West continuously to this day trying to push some sort of agreement with the regime that murders its own citizens and calls for the genocide of the Jewish people? Why are leaders of the Western democratic states for now many, many years still bending over to have some sort of agreement on a nuclear weapons program. Where are the democratic values in our universities? Where are the democratic values in the halls of governance in Europe and North America? And the quote of Primo Levi in particular rings true today. Cowardice and holding on to some sort of idea, which blows my mind. You know, I grew up in Montreal. I see Erwin Kotler is here with us. It was a, an amazing community, and a, a, many of the members of the Jewish community in Montreal were survivors. I grew up around a community of survivors. You know, the grocery store, the gas station, our teachers, tattoos on their arms, survivors. And how is it possible that this is the discourse in 2023? 
in less than two generations, Jews were exterminated for not being white. Jews were exterminated, taken out of their jobs, taken out of their homes, put into ghettos, sent on railroad tracks into crematoriums because they were not white and they were poisoning the purity of the white Aryan nation. In less than two generations, led by postmodern intellectuals at our finest universities, Jews are now being told we are white. And it's not we are white, welcome to the club and so sorry for what we did. So sorry for what our parents and grandparents did to the Jewish people, to Western civilization and the values of democracy and inclusion and citizenship. Sorry, no. We are now being defined as white, as the quintessential colonial racist apartheid supporters. And this is what passes as high scholarship and intellectual discourse in our universities today. And it's no wonder then that there's a silence on Yom HaShoah when a leader of a major country openly and clearly instigates, calls for the annihilation of the Jewish people and the intellectuals and our political leaders in the Western world remain silent because these ideas have permeated intellectual and political discourse. So if the Jews are the quintessential epitome of white supremacy and of apartheid and colonialism, when the leaders of the Iranian revolutionary regime and the Muslim Brotherhood call for the annihilation of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, well, the progressive postmodern intellectuals either quietly agree or they remain silent and are cowards in the face of reactionary incitement to genocide. And it's incitement to genocide that we are speaking about on Yom HaShoah in 2023. I think I, I, I wanna leave time for my colleagues, but it blows my mind that in 2023, this is the reality that we find ourselves. And I'll just end, I guess, on a, on a positive note. Barry Cosman, who's a scholar, a uh, sociologist from London and, and, and taught at Trinity College in, in, in Hartford, Connecticut, he, he wrote, this is about uh, 10, 11 years ago, how incredible the Jewish people are. And if you think about it, he wrote that over 90% of the Jewish people 11 years ago do not live in the land of their grandparents nor speak the language of their grandparents, 90%. So not only is there the Holocaust and the extermination of Jewish people for not being white, and it goes deeper than that, which I won't get into, but the, the, the complete movement of European civilization to Israel, to the Americas and beyond, that despite this profound displacement at proportions that I can't even express and understand, we, we created the state of Israel, a strong, vibrant democracy, a strong economy, a strong military. We, we are more educated than ever before. We are more capable, perhaps, than ever, ever before, and even more healthier than ever before. More books are being written and translated than ever before. More yeshivas, etc. So despite the Holocaust and the Shoah, we are still here, and we are strong, and I hope that uh, we remember where we came from and the leaders in Israel come to some sort of consensus and remain strong because we need a strong state of Israel for the Jewish people to be strong. 
and uh, and to to bear witness. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. <clears throat> that was a very uh, powerful set of comments, and uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a great privilege. As a non-Jewish person, it's a great privilege to be you know, sharing time with you uh, today to uh, speak about these things. Um, you mentioned your uh, colleague, Dr. Lev Torpa, and um, it's now time to um, hand the floor over to, to Lev. Uh, as I'm sure most of you will know, uh, Lev is uh, one of our visiting scholars at the Iskat Wolf Institute Centre, um, but he's also a senior research fellow at the Centre for Cyber Law and Policy at the University of Haifa and uh, a visiting research fellow at the uh, Yad Vashem in, uh, in Jerusalem. So, uh, Lev, over to you for uh, 10 minutes or so. And um, just to say that um, there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions and comments afterwards. I've seen a couple of hands go up and comments left in the in the chat, but I'll be I've made a note and I'll be uh, I'll be coming to you all after Lev's uh, comments. So, Lev, over to you first. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Julian, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to us and learning just a bit more about this topic, about Holocaust remembrance and the importance of um, remembering it in the future. And I want to start with a few things. Um, first is a question, and second is a quote and I'm going to quote um, a neo-Nazi, actually. And then I will discuss the dangers of Holocaust denial in, in modern times, in the age of the internet, and how it might affect us all in the very near future. So the, my, my first question is, what is the danger of Holocaust denial? Why do we have to remember it? Why do we have to commemorate it? Um, Seemingly, it is. it can be just an historical event, and in a few years' time, it will be. People will read about it in, in books and, and articles, um, and it will be less evident in our lives. More so in, in Europe, in the United States, in Russia, and in other places, but, but also less evident in Israel, actually. And the danger is that is what... The danger is that when people don't won't remember such an atrocity, history might repeat itself. Maybe with the Jewish people again, maybe with other groups of people again. But this, I think, is the most important issue we have to remember. That once we forget that something like this happened, we as as, as people globally might do something uh, similar. And as we all know, people tend to forget quite fast and history tends to repeat itself. This is the danger of the history of the Jewish people has repeated itself through thousands of years again and again and again with such pogroms. And this is the danger. The, now, what is the, what is the real and immediate danger of that right now? especially in the age of cyberspace and the age of social media and information. Um, I actually want to take you about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and quote a uh, somebody who was back then a prominent neo-Nazi, someone by the name of, um, <clears throat> of John Milton. Um, so John Milton Jr actually founded the Aryan News Agency in, in 93 and in 95 he published an article called On Tactics and Strategy for Usenet. Now Usenet was a, a an old-fashioned um, um, social media platform. It was like a board, something like a, an email listserv. And he wrote in his the importance of the internet. He wrote this, and I quote again, and I quote a neo-Nazi on the importance of the internet. He writes, 
Usenet offers enormous opportunity for the Aryan resistance to disseminate our message to the unaware and the ignorant. It is the only relatively uncensored so far free for mass medium which we have available. The state cannot yes, yet stop us from advertising our ideas and organizations on Usenet, but I can assure you this will not always be the case. Now is the time to grasp the weapon, which is the net, and wielding it skillfully and wisely while you may still do so freely. Remember, our overall Usenet strategy must be to repeat powerful themes over and over and over. We cannot compete with the, and I quote, Jews media, of course, as our propaganda dissemination is but a very small fraction of everywhere pervasive Zionist propaganda. However, our ideas possess an energy that truth alone contains. Our ideas, when matched one-to-one -one with the chimbre of the Jews, overwhelm them with ease, because ours are in sync with reality. One well-written message contains our ideas, has much greater bang for the buck. So this was written about 35 years ago. <clears throat> Um, and it is very evident nowadays. It is um, it is evident since they they have turned it into something of a trend. Now there now I I discovered two main trends of Holocaust denial. First is whitewashed Holocaust denial, which of course um, Stephanie uh, mentioned. This is soft Holocaust denial. They don't extremely deny the Holocaust, but they say the numbers weren't right, the, the evidence are not maybe wrong, it must be um, debated and investigated on and on. This is one trend. The other trend is the hardcore Holocaust denial. This is not done uh, very much publicly, especially in countries where Holocaust denial is not, um, not legal. In many, in over 20 countries in Europe, Holocaust denial is not legal. So they deny anonymously. Um, and they, they, this, these trends type story sometimes interwined. So nowadays, those who deny the Holocaust, who once denied through um, maybe radio and, and uh, paper and articles, now deny with sophisticated methods of misinformation and disinformation. Their denial is very organized and the worrisome factor is the rich. They reach millions of people, uh, millions of people that consume it. They don't just need to read their um, pseudoscientific books or pseudoscientific articles. They can look glance just in one second at a meme or an illustration and the reach is tremendous. And just to just to point out for some examples, I will quickly share my um, my screen with you. And I, I want to show you that you can see highlighted, this is a, a table of prominent Holocaust denial channels on Telegram. Everybody uses Telegram nowadays globally. And I have highlighted this, for instance, a channel called Holocaust Lies Exposed. It in, in 2021 till 2022, they had over half a million views. And if you accumulate all the views together, you reach millions. And this is just on Telegram. There are other websites on the on the on the internet. Oh, obviously, but this is very, very simple. How simple is it? Well, I will just show you a live demo. This is Telegram. These are many, many channels of Holocaust denial information. Now look at all the information out there, articles, texts, memes, books, audio recordings, and so on and so on. And it just goes on and on and on. Now, there, there are texts, they even share books of 600 pages. Um, they even share, by the way, their own kind of trends. Look at this, I found this. What, what type of focus denial there are you? Minimizer, denier, questioner, trivializer, 
and so on. This is this is almost exactly our academic definition of those who do soft denial, hard denial, trivialization, and last one, sicko, which quotes, of course it happened, can't wait for the next one. And it goes on and on and on and on. And the rich, again, look at this Holocaust lies, lies exposed. The rich of Holocaust lies exposed. Where is it? Yeah, here it is. It's tremendous. Um, they have an index. They create metadata for the eagles for sharing. They create, again, videos, illustrations, memes. They use emojis. They use a lot of data, a lot of data. They even look at this, comedians tell Holocaust jokes. They have a title list. This is just insane. And they reach millions of people. Now, I just want to finish with this. If we, as a society, as a global society, won't act to, to debunk it, or maybe stop some of this dissemination of propaganda, of disinformation, of denial of the Holocaust, people in 20 or 30 years will just consume information from their uh, platforms. They won't regard platforms like Yad Vashem or Yushem in Washington or other or uh, Museum of Tolerance or many other places, institutions. They will just disregard them and consume and be educated by these um, short clips and audio recordings and uh, memes and illustrations. And thank you again, and I look forward for uh, questions and discussion. Thank you, um, Lev. We had three very different presentations there, didn't we? We had sort of a uh, first from Stephanie with a kind of sort of forensic look really at the sort of definitional considerations and typologies and really uh, gave us that sort of very rich understanding of, of how these things can be categorized and, and perhaps made slightly easier to, to conceptualize. Um, and then from Charles, a, a great sort of call to arms really for the continued vigilance within, particularly within sort of educational settings. And from, from Lev, a very sort of, uh, evidence-based approach with some data-rich approach of thinking about the uh, specifics of, of current Holocaust denial. Now we've had a number of people raise hands and, and um, ask questions, so I've, I've, I'm going to try and take them in order. I've been jotting down uh, names of the, as they popped up. So um, Diane Kunt, I'd like to come to you first, please. Do you have a, a comment or a question? I have both, but first I have a picture. I don't know if you can see this picture. It's not a good one. Uh, this is my grandmother, Rivka Pearl Yanisovich, who was murdered on February the 23rd, 1942 at Helmo. Uh, and I think it's just appropriate to start. That was she, that was her life. You know, we've heard say our names. Let's Let's say the names. And these are my parents. Saba and Joseph Bernstein, my mother survived Auschwitz, uh, the Witch Ghetto and Hofstadt, and my father, the Covenant Ghetto, Dachau, Mildorf, Kumferding, et cetera. In that context, I can tell you what they said. And then I'll tell you what I think as a historian, I diplomatic historian taught at Yale. Now I work, uh, done other things, and now I'm back to it, the Brandeis Center. The first thing is that they said, of course, in Auschwitz, don't let the world forget. But what, and as my mother said, people said that she got to Auschwitz the same month as Eli Wiesel and Anne Frank uh, in that summer of 1944. The Witch Ghetto was the last ghetto to be liquidated in Poland. Uh, on the other hand, what does that mean? And first of all, let me say that there always was Holocaust denial. In the late 1940s, the chief rabbi of, of Paris went to Pope Pius XII and said, let us give us back the hidden children, because you have a, a number of hidden children in France, uh, becomes very controversial. And he says, there weren't 6 million Jews killed. They're all in Argentina and other Latin American countries. This is the late 40s. So we've always had a context of Holocaust denial. But what has made it worse, as we know, is the internet, which everybody's talked about, but also the huge demographic changes. The fact that the Jews are a smaller and smaller percentage of the United States um, and East Western Europe and uh, Holocaust denying sub, uh, uh, citizens 
are a larger percentage. And I give you a telling example at my former, where I have my PhD from, which is Yale and where I taught, was in 1998, my colleague's father, Nat Lewin, did a case to get Orthodox students to be able to work, live off campus or live in sex segregated dorms because it was their religion. Yale turned them down, they, they went to court, they lost. Uh, last month, a number of Muslim students did the same thing and Yale said, absolutely, you're right. What's the difference? Why are we not winning? And I would suggest that we have the intersectionality issue, which is terrible. The fact that students go on the internet. My youngest child took a Holocaust course in her high school this year, and they spent the whole time debating, was there a Holocaust? And how many people and why the Jews, when actually there were 17 million people murdered in the Holocaust. So why the Jews? And you know, you nope, the teacher says, oh, that's your opinion. So where does we go from here? And I would suggest that the wonderful presentations we have, we have to make them to our fellow Jewish professors because our children are being propagandized to an extent that I just can't believe is possible on today's campus. And I say this because I have another child who's graduating from Penn who says she cannot be out as a Zionist on her campus. She's at, you know, as an LGBT person, that's fine, but not a Zionist. And Penn is one of the better places. And it's by fighting and standing up. But so many of the Jews, our Jews are the people who are not standing up. The Holocaust memorials are fine, but what's more important is understanding that we have to fight. And um, as Brooke Goldstein says, we have to organize, especially on campuses and especially in international institutions. And Mr. Collar, you have done such an amazing job. I'm in awe of everything you have done. So I get to say thank you. Uh, to fight back these pernicious lies because our children and our children's children are being propagandized but we have to get our Jews on side because they're the ones who are giving legitimacy to Holocaust denial. Are the Jews who say, Israel, um, another one of my children, I have eight children, so I, there are a lot of them. One of them is in Ohio State. The professor has Nakba and Holocaust. We'll have them on the same day. We can debate which is worse. I leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, there was a question from, let me just remind myself, uh, uh, a question from, um, ah, yes, a question from uh, Tony Cummins. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, would you like to repeat the question? Would you like me to read it for you? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. If yeah, I'll, you... uh, I'll ask it. Please do. Um, I, uh, I live in Paris. I'm an American. I'm a journalist. And um, I live not far from the uh, what was the notorious uh, Velodrome d'Hiver in, uh, in Paris, um, uh, site of the uh, roundup of, of French Jews by French police in 1942. So my question is for Professor Scher, um, apart from the internet, how does this, how does Holocaust denial and Holocaust um, and the diminishment of uh, Holocaust um, uh, as a phenomenon, how, is, how does this represent itself in French politics specifically? I am sorry. Um, first, um, uh, in France, uh, Robert Foisson, the main Holocaust denier, died a few years ago. And uh, the movement uh, uh, is less important since he died. So it's a point. And then uh, another Holocaust denier, Vincent Renoir, I don't know if you heard about him. He's been capped and he's in England waiting for his extradition. So uh, the movement is less important. Since that, we have also a publishing house like uh, Erkai. It's a, from, a publishing house from Jean Plantin. Jean Plantin is an Holocaust denier who made a, a memory and a PhD, not a PhD, but a memory and a master 
in uh, in France in an 80 and uh, now he's a publisher and he's uh, publishing Holocaust denied books and also um, um, distortion book so different but still he is here and is publishing and selling on a platform e-commerce platform his books also we have uh, Alain Soral we have his publishing house Contre Culture who is publishing some Holocaust denied books this is what we see in a, like a movement who support Holocaust denial. Then that we have a far right and extremic, extremist politician who is uh, supporting Holocaust denial. We don't see less, we see less now uh, far right, if far left supporting Holocaust denial. We don't see it. Judene is still doing Holocaust denial comments from time to time, but he's there is is stopping more and more because of the law in France, so it's more stronger than in other countries. So uh, the the Front National, the uh, RN now that we're calling, is uh, is less and less supporting Holocaust denial. And Marine Le Pen is not doing it. We can see it that it's less important for them. But still, we have the far right who is still doing it. And more um, like the journal, I don't know if you know the journal Rivarol, who is a journal who has been uh, supporting Vincent Renoir and supporting also Holocaust denial, an interview from time to time, and some have Holocaust denial. And this uh, journal can be seen, even if there is a law, can be seen on some uh, new um, um, a public, public store to buy it. So it's, uh, it's an issue. So I think I answer to your question. If you have more question about it, I can do it. It's it's, it's all about trends. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> now I've uh, I've noted that uh, Professor Nelson has had his hand up for some time. So thank you for your patience, Professor. Over uh, to you. Hi. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question that's a spin on one of the themes of today's event which is what happens to Holocaust memory uh, and witness in 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Um, when I taught a, a seminar on the Holocaust repeatedly, I always challenged my students with a question that no one could answer, which was, are we confident that we can retain the Holocaust as the premier example of moral witness against evil? or does there come a time at some point in the future, let's say when all of us are dead, when Holocaust memory becomes an antiquarian interest, somewhat like the Peloponnesian Wars, an, anti an obscure antiquarian subject. And I always answered my students that I had, I had no confidence whatsoever in the capacity of my fellow humans to keep the Holocaust at the center of moral witness and indeed that at some point it would become merely an antiquarian interest. So what do you think? And to whom is that directed, Professor? Any of the speakers that's relevant to what everyone said. I can I can give my opinion about it if you want Please to. Do. I'm um, I, 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 I found this question all the time, the fact that um, uh, survivor are lo uh, lo um, we are losing survivor to, to, for, as a witness and how it's going to be for Holocaust denial. Is, is, is Holocaust denial is, is becoming stronger because survivor are, are, are leaving. So it's a, it's a very important question. And usually the people are fair, are fair that it's going, uh, the Holocaust denier are going to win because of that. And I, I would like to be more optimistic about it. And uh, Lev explained that uh, the survival are um, very important and I, and I agree with him, but at the same time, we can see, for example, the Shoah Foundation, that it's a strong foundation who give a video witness are here to to, to, um, to give their witness to, to give their, their um, uh, witness about uh, the events. So it's important to see that the Shoah Foundation give a, a lot of. Um, of course, we don't have any more the survivor in uh, Oral and in a classroom to 
to help us to understand the events. But we have their witness video. Uh, we have also the history that is here. It's common that uh, oral history go through uh, written history. And we shouldn't be fair that the fact that the Holocaust survivors are living because we have their witness and we have so many archives, so many documents who can prove the Holocaust that even if we don't have the survivor with us, that of course we're losing the memory, we're losing the, the emotion of their, their witness. But at the same time, we, the history is not only written with them and with the witness of the survivor. So I think it's very important to explain um, this. this, this. Uh, if I just may say a word. Um, Please. <laughs> I'm not an expert at this, but I've been in the last few weeks trying to understand the artificial intelligence revolution. And I'm not an expert, but in my humble opinion, I'm I'm quite terrified how um, images are, are shifted. People can create uh, statements and other people's voices that are untrue. There'll be technology, video technology, that you can have a, a, a speech of Ben-Gurion saying certain things that are just not true, that were created through artificial intelligence. Singers will create new songs without their input through artificial intelligence. Photos are being created and recreated and altered. So I don't know. We're entering into a, a technological era where I, I'm terrified that the truth is going to be erased. I don't, I don't know how we're going. I don't know how we're going to be able to um, we you know sift through what's true and what's uh fabricated it's a bit scary yeah it certainly is um there was a question from uh lawrence brust which i'd like to um direct towards lev um lev in your um in your presentation and in in lots of the work that i've seen you um you've analyzed anti-semitism uh from the far right but lawrence asks about the problem coming from the extreme left wing and also uh, coming from Muslim extremists. And I wondered if you could just speak to those two sources. Clearly, uh, it's a sensitive issue, but I just wondered whether you might have some remarks for, for Lawrence, please. <clears throat> um, yes, thank you for the question. It is a sensitive issue, but it is quite similar to the topics debated about the far right. Um, extreme Muslims typically deny the Holocaust due to um, due to political reasons. They want to they want to steal the victimhood of the Jewish people because they want to present the Jewish people and present Israel as a strong party that obviously uh, denies certain rights and privileges from other parties. Uh, within the within the area of the Middle East and within Europe. They want to um, downgrade the Jewish people and they want to steal the victimhood so that uh, attention will not be uh, not be provided to the Jewish people and to such things like Holocaust education and um, combat uh, of anti-Semitism. Now the left is, and this is obviously true for the Red-Green Alliance as well, However, some people in the left are not just um, pure leftists. There are also people living within certain um, states. And within these states, for instance, in, in, in Europe, there are those who try to um, whitewash their history, to whitewash um, their nation's collaboration with the Nazis. This is obviously more prominent within the, within the uh, far right but it is also true to some degree uh, within the, the left and the mainstream left. Um, in most cases, uh, the left, they do, do uh, um, agree to the, to the Jewish victimhood and to the Holocaust. But again, there are people, there are those who are leftists and yet they choose to, um, to distort, not completely deny, but distort the, um, to steal a bit of the victimhood. Thank you. That's uh, that's really helpful. Um, there are a few hands up, which and I'm going to come to everyone as soon as I can. 
But um, I just wondered, um, Erwin, I wondered if you might have some reflections on what we've heard so far, uh, and um, especially given the day to day. Uh, Erwin Cutler, would you like to uh, add some remarks to the discussion? You're on mute. Yeah, on, on the issue that uh, Charles raised about uh, President Raisi of Iran, I mean, here's a case study of uh, impunity. He was a member of the death squad in Iran in 1988, uh, responsible for the mass murder of Iranian dissidents and got promoted. And he's been seriously promoted um, each time he engages in more violations. Uh, he ends up going from deputy prosecutor to attorney general uh, to chief justice to president. So you have a real culture of impunity and it relates also to the matter of the uh, incitement uh, to genocide because it seems to be forgotten by my uh, colleagues in the legal world that the very incitement to genocide is a standalone crime under the genocide convention, whether or not acts of genocide follow. And that's a clear uh, jurisprudence in that, Canadian Supreme Court, Rwandan Tribunal, and uh, the like. So that's just uh, the first point. The second, on the matter of uh, right-wing and left-wing uh, anti-Semitism, Holocaust, and all that, one of the things that concerns me is what I've felt now in the two years that I've been a special envoy in these matters of Holocaust remembrance, combating anti-Semitism, the real problem that we're facing now is the increasing mainstreaming, normalizing, legitimation of anti-Semitism in the political culture, the popular culture, the entertainment culture, the sports culture, campus culture, media culture. I think it's that kind of mainstreaming and the critical mass that is underpinning that mainstream uh, that is something that we have to uh, pay attention to because if we do the usual unnecessary a tripartite uh, paradigm combating anti-Semitism from the far right, from the far left, radical Islam, we may miss uh, what to me is the greater concern at this point, and that is the mainstreaming and, and normalizing of anti-Semitism. Thank you. That's very helpful indeed. Um, uh, I also, I've seen some hands, so I'm going to go around um, in order <laughs> that I've seen them. So, um, Philip uh, Spivak, would you like to um, add your question. We've got about 20 minutes left for the discussion. So, um, yeah, if you could make comments uh, concise, please. Uh, Diane Ray, uh, raised my idea here. Um, and again, history repeating itself. Um, when you have uh, independent Israel Independence Day uh, celebration, uh, at their survival, this coincides with the uh, Muslims' Nakba. Uh, should I say celebration, uh, demonstrations, or whatever. Uh, Nakba uh, refers to uh, the catastrophe that five Muslim, uh, Muslim countries, Arab countries, could not wipe Israel off the map in 1948. And the War of Independence continues to this day as they continue to try. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a question for any of the speakers or shall I uh, go down my list to the next person? Uh, any of them want to comment, please do so. Anyone like to comment? In that case, then I'd like to come to Daniel Stetsky, who's had his hand up for a few minutes. Daniel, over to you. Maybe you could turn your camera on if you're able to. Uh, thank you. I didn't realize it wasn't on in the first place. Thank you, and um, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, I would like to uh, quote a certain statistics to to um, to present motivation behind what, you, what, I'm, what I'm going to say. Because some of you may know the uh, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, conducts surveys of anti-Semitic sentiments across the world. They cover pretty much the whole world today, and among other questions among questions on that topic, they present to people various questions on the Holocaust, familiarization with the um, phenomenon, and then what they think about. 
So they asked in the recent survey something as simple as the, the following. Have you heard about the Holocaust in Europe during World War II? And uh, half of the respondents, so half of the adult population of this planet said yes. The other half said two things. I don't know or not too sure, don't know. Okay, so half and half. We live in a world where half of these people don't know what it is even about. When they ask those who did know, well, what do you think about the Holocaust? What do you think, what, what actually happened? Then 4% of those who, who knew something said that Holocaust is a myth or it didn't happen. A small minority, but my uh, issue is now with those people who knew nothing. This is a particular demographic that is waiting out there to be educated. What they will think eventually depends on what kind of message will be transmitted to them and by whom and how convincing that message would be. And this is a critical issue here. So I think to educate that particular part, and I'm asking now in this forum, has enough been done on that particular issue? Now you can say uh, there are Holocaust educational programs, in, even in schools all over across Europe. Um, well, yes, they exist. And uh, to tell you the status, something about the status of these programs, I can tell you that uh, a few years ago, I participated in a committee run by the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. So it's an advisory body that advises the European Commission on various issues related to minorities, among them Jews. And uh, one of their roles is to advise on particular Holocaust educational programs, provide funding and judge them, judge their um, adequacy, et cetera. And that particular committee had difficulty deciding which Holocaust education program to adopt. Um, and then being part of that committee, I said that the program that needs to be adopted or recommended is a program that has some sort of measurement of its value, measurement of its impact, of its effect. Just from how these people look, just from how, how faces around the table look, I could tell you that it's the first time somebody presented this particular question to them. Are the programs adequate? How do we know? And I present this to this particular forum as well. Take this, the presentation that Lev gave before. How many Telegram channels that present Holocaust denial he, present, he, he showed us? Maybe 10, maybe more. How many channels like this exist on Holocaust education? How many? Where are they? So my question is really to the community of uh, Jewish scholars, to what extent we own that subject, to what extent the Jewish scholars, the Jewish communities, scholars in general, are taking seriously that element of Holocaust education, let's call it that, and owning the more difficult, the more refined elements of that education. For example, numerical elements. If somebody asks um, a question, a Holocaust denier, or, or more likely a potential Holocaust denier, how many Jews were killed? Six million, you're saying. Prove it. How do you know? How do you know how to estimate the number of victims of this genocide, of that genocide? How many people actually own an explanation or own an explanation of that issue? I would say not many. So um, uh, I think um, I've, ten, I've, I've, taken, I've taken time <laughs> to present my argument. Whoever feels like they want to relate to it, obviously you're very welcome. Thank you. And before I um, hand over to our speakers to respond, uh, I'd like to come to Glenn Timmermans, who has uh, requested an opportunity to ask a follow-up question, which relates to Daniel's comments. Over to you, Glenn. Cheers. Thanks, Julian. Um, both, I mean, this is really a follow-up to Daniel, but also partly to what Tony came and said. Tony was speaking about situations in France and um, da Daniel more generally. My question is, um, clearly, we, we know the, what, one of the issues with Holocaust education clearly is it's a lot of it happens in the Anglo sphere. I mean, we, yeah, we all are speaking English tonight and much of the scholarship is in English. And clearly there's lots happening in 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 German and French and elsewhere. But part of the world we tend to ignore is, is, is Asia. Um, and I just wondered, 
two things, two related things. Do do we have a sense from experts like Dr. Small and others of the extent of Holocaust denial and distortion outside Europe and and and, and North America? Do do we know what sort of Holocaust denial is going on in 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 Asia? Um, and then related to that, when is 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 the idea going to the idea of you know, what will people know about the Holocaust in a hundred years' time? And I think one of the things we have to recognize is part one of the reasons the Holocaust is talked about a lot is because we live in the Anglosphere and the 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 important influence of something like the United States of America, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. But if if we're going to be pessimistic and accept what some people say that that Asia is going to be the future, but that is also a danger because once the American Anglosphere influence declines, can we rely on a powerful China or a powerful to give this subject the same attention it deserves? Well, the moment we have people like Erwin Kotler and we have um, Deborah Lipstadt, we have very prominent people out there. Um, doing what they can for Holocaust education, but should power eventually shift to East Asia, that might do. We we need to do more in that part of the world, I think, to keep this memory alive. Um, that's my comment, and I think it relates to what Daniel was saying. So, thank you. So, back over to the speakers. We've got two questions there. One about sort of ownership of of Holocaust education, and one from Glenn about um, education or knowledge. Um, from uh, from some non English speaking context. So over to the speakers. Who would like to who would like to begin with some comments back? Stephanie, you might need to unmute yourself. There you are. Welcome back. Um, just about what uh, has been said. Um, anti defamation league. I saw the um, I saw the survey of anti defamation league, and it's true. It was training. And a few days ago, Anti-Defamation League um, launched a new uh, link of a website, a link of a website on Holocaust denial and uh, with uh, explanation of history, distortion, refutation, main Holocaust deniers. So I think it's a very good initiative. And I looked at it today and I think it's very good. So it's a it's a good part. It's a good way to do it. And there is other website who is here, and maybe we don't heard about it, but they are here to refute Holocaust denial and uh, doing education about it. You have uh, the website of Deborah Lipstein, uh, Holocaust on Trial, who has a, a special link on education and refuting rebuting Holocaust denial, so it's very important. You have also in German, in French, Holocaust Controversy, it's a very good website who do refutation of Holocaust denial. So there is a, a good um, uh, tool, there, 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 there are tools that exist to refute Holocaust denial, but maybe we don't know them enough. And also about education, I think it's important to see that uh, Yad Vashem, for example, or the Memorial of the Shoah in France, are doing a training Holocaust, um, Holocaust student and Holocaust teacher, uh, study, uh, uh, training a uh, teacher about the Holocaust to help them to refute to, um, Holocaust denial in the classroom. And it's very important to do it. <coughs> so they, more and more we have this um, training with doing it. And it's very important. And there is a lot of teacher who are coming to this training. As well, I can say to do my auto promotion that I'm doing, I, I just published a book in French on Holocaust denial and refutation as a tool to refute Holocaust denial. And it's a it's kind of initiative is very important to do it. And I hope my book will be translated in English as well to more refute Holocaust denial and, um, and doing at the same time education and Holocaust. So this is kind of answer. Thank you, Lev. Yes, thank you. I will just want to add to these two questions. Uh, no, first, we definitely don't do enough to educate about the Holocaust. And we sometimes find ourselves, uh, and I'm talking about myself as well, we find, sometimes find ourselves speaking to, to the ones who are convinced already to the same, to the people that are like-minded like us, they they also know, understand the importance of uh, 
of the Holocaust. And uh, yes, Daniel, you, completely, you are completely right about the importance of educating the mainstream and, and especially those who are ignorant simply because they don't know about enough about this, this topic. And then it can go either way. Either they will consume more reliable data or they will consume less reliable data. And, and it's completely, sometimes completely arbitrary. And if you take into consideration the fact that the other side is putting quite a lot of efforts to develop these websites and chains and, and books and journals and so on, you're right to say that we should do enough. Now about this, there is a website, a joint program by the World Jewish Congress and UNESCO and I put the link down in the chat. It's called um, abouthalkos.org. It is a website to answer the questions of um, who uh, perpetrated the Holocaust, what was the SS, why were the ghettos, and so on and so on. And it, it is, and how it relates to the questions about Asia and, and South Asia or um, East Asia. For instance, Jonas? in the Chinese TikTok Jonas? app, in the Chinese TikTok app. Uh, sorry, can you? Uh, yeah. In the Chinese TikTok app, UNESCO actually, TikTok joined, joined forces with UNESCO and the WJS to combat Holocaust denial. And whenever people search in TikTok um, Holocaust denial, Holocaust related topics, they are referred to, uh, to this website, to this credible information to this website. This is just one tool, and of course, and this is done by a Chinese application, not by, by an American one, not by American social media platforms. Um, but yes, in in Asia, people usually know much less about the Holocaust, uh, and they're also a, a target audience we need to to address. Thanks. Thank you. We're just entering the last five minutes, and I'm aware that a couple of people have had their hand up for some time. So okay. I'll try can and get I, to it from. Can I oh. quickly respond to the the questions? Of course. Okay. Thanks. I'll be brief. Um, so I think to to Glenn's comments, I, I understand that you teach Holocaust studies in in China, so you must know infinitely more than I do. But my impression in Asia and in India, China, they're they're sort of. Um, there's a fascination in some circles with Jewish people, and there's sort of a, almost a, a very positive uh, impression of Jewish history and culture, which sort of potentially bleeds into a sort of uh, an anti-Semitism of sorts. Um, but I think that the anti-Semitism in Europe and Western civilization runs deeper. It goes deep into its history. Uh, into its culture, into its religion, into its philosophy, into the social sciences and even the sciences. Um, and of course, this has been exported to the Middle East and to sort of Muslim countries in the last century. And I think these two spaces are the most volatile in terms of um, the crisis of contemporary anti-Semitism. So you have I think discrimination against Jews and Muslim societies sporadically over the centuries, but you really have with the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the exporting of a specifically European notion of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred, which is inherently genocidal um, in the words of, in the teachings of Robert Wistra. So you have the, the exporting, for example, the protocols of the elders of Zion and even Nazi ideology into the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood being a reaction to European colonialism that takes European anti-Semitism and fuses it with a very narrow understanding of Islam. And this is, uh, you know, begins in, in Egypt about 100 years ago and is exported throughout the region. And Elie Wiesel always taught that, you know, that Auschwitz, um, did not happen because of the railroad tracks and the crematoriums. Elie Wiesel always reminded us that the railroad tracks and the crematoriums and the final solution was actually created by words and ideas. And it was the words and ideas that, that lay the foundation to separating Jews from society, putting them in ghettos and exporting them to death camps. 
Um, and it's these very same words, and I'm speaking now as a scholar and I'm being very deliberate, it's these very same words that form the ideology of the Iranian revolutionary regime, of the Muslim Brotherhood, of the Qatari regime, the trade in genocidal anti-Semitism, and the Qatari regime, for example, and the Saudi Arabians for decades, and maybe there's a shift now, hopefully there is, have been funding Western universities, laying the foundation of the words and ideas that dehumanize and demonize the Jewish people. Yosef Kawadawi said repeatedly, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood through his life said that the true believer must complete the work of Hitler. He wasn't a Holocaust denier, he was a proponent of the Holocaust. Yosef Kawadawi was a founding director of Islamic studies at Oxford University, a man who called on all true believers to finish the work of Hitler. And this is what our finest institutions are peddling. And we have to remember as scholars of anti-Semitism that the foundation of the Shoah began with these words and ideas. But it also began with philosophers and scientists, scientists of eugenics, theologians, and that this anti-Semitism that was permeating, and I use my words carefully, Western universities and institutions of higher education lay the groundwork for Nazism. And today, we know through our studies at ISGAP, billions, and I'm billions with a B, of dollars have been funneled into the finest Western universities in Europe and North America by foundations and proponents of this ideology. And we remain silent. And in the words of Primo Levi, there is a cowardice and there's an acquiescence. And to me, it's this crisis of contemporary anti-Semitism that I think we have to deal with as scholars and of Jewish people who are feeling the pressure more and more as the years pass. And I'll end on a final note. Elie Wiesel, Charles, I'd like to bring another guest in just I'll for just, a question. I'll just, finish, because... I'll just finish with the words of Elie yeah. Wiesel. Anti-Semitism, the demonization of Israel is not a Jewish parochial problem. It is not a Jewish parochial problem. Anti-Semitism is the early warning system of the health of democratic societies and of society in general. What be, anti-Semitism begins with the Jews, as Elie Wiesel said, but it never, ever, ever ends with the Jews. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Spindle, did you have a question for our speakers? Oh. No. No. Um, okay, then we're, we're, we're just coming up to um, 4.30 over here in the UK. So we're going to bring the session to a close in the uh, next few minutes. Um, Professor Sher, do you have any final comments before we close off the session, please? Yeah. Stephanie, would you like to share any final comments with us before we close off the session? Sorry. I didn't know that it was me. Um, no, I, it's, it's difficult to say something after the word of Charles, because of course I agree with what he said, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a strong thread. And Lev also explained about uh, the dark web, how it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the thread that we have to deal with. And it's a hell of an issue with Holocaust denial are still here on the internet and we have a lot of problems that we have with this. And um, so uh, we have work on that subject and it was very good to explore them and to speak about it. And I hope that we will continue talking about it and because the more that we talk about it, the more that we explain the problem, the issue, we understand that there is a problem and we have to solve it. So it's important to talk about it. That's it. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Lev, would you like any final remarks before we hand back to Charles to close the session? 
Thank you. Uh, I completely agree with Charles and with Stephanie. We need to we need to speak the truth, even if it is sometimes uncomfortable politically, to other members uh, of society, other extreme members in Europe and the in the U.S. and in other places. And of course, um, if they disseminate their information, we should disseminate our information further. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you to you both for such uh, fine presentations. And uh, thank you to Charles for the opportunity to chair on, uh, on such an important uh, occasion as today. And uh, I'll hand back to you for some closing comments before we finish the session. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for hosting and sharing the event. And thank you, Stephanie and Lev, for your input. So on behalf of everybody at ISGAP, I'd like to thank the three of you very much. And I guess the final words are, I, I think it's a day of reflection. Maybe take some time to read Primo Levi or Elie Wiesel or other witnesses to uh, the unspeakable tragedy that uh, we're commemorating today. So thank you all for being here and stay well and strong. <laughs>